Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast that you're listening to right now, thank you so much, called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It is a daily podcast, 365 days a year, and each day we talk to an author about all of the things related to their career, their book, their life, and more in 30 minutes or less, because who has time? I am now an author myself, although I wasn't when I started this podcast, and you can get my new memoir, Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature, wherever books are sold starting July 1st, and my children's book, Princess Charming. You can learn more about me at zibbyowens.com, but really, you're here to learn more about the authors, and that is what we're going to do. Also, be sure to check out all the other podcasts in the Zcast Podcast Network. You can learn more at zcastnetwork.com. Dot com and definitely check out those shows as well. I hope you'll all check out the all new Zibby Mag, Z I B B Y M A G, the literary lifestyle destination with essays, book news, a lit lifestyle feature, and even some classes. Check it out, zibbymag.com. Sally Coslow's episode about the real Mrs. Tobias is one of our guest-hosted episodes. As I've mentioned, 30 of the episodes over the next few months will be guest-hosted by a crew of amazing other authors, podcasters, and fabulous women. This one is being hosted by Alicia Fernandez Miranda, who is one of our Zibby Books authors and also hosts the podcast Quit Your Day Job. So you will hear more about her own memoir, My What If Year, but now she is going to interview Sally Coslow, the real Mrs. Tobias. Sally is the author of The Other Side of Paradise, bringing to life F. Scott Fitzgerald's passionate relationship with secretly Jewish Shayla Graham, the widow Waltz, the late lamented Molly Marks, and with friends like these and the non-fictional slashing toward adulthood. Her debut novel, Little Pink Slips, was inspired by her long career as the editor-in-chief of iconic McCall's magazine. Her books have been published in 14 countries. Sally has written 100-plus essays and articles for anthologies, major magazines, newspapers, and websites, lectured at the F. Scott Fitzgerald Society in Toulouse, France, as well as many colleges, libraries, synagogues, women's groups, and book clubs, and has taught at the Writing Institute of Sarah Lawrence College. People often say she's the first person they've met from Fargo, North Dakota, and Sally also contributed to one of my anthologies. All right. Well, Sally, welcome to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. We are so excited to have you here today to talk about The Real Mrs. Tobias. Well, I'm very, very, very excited to be here. Thanks, Alicia. And so yesterday was launch day for you. How are you feeling? I feel excited, happy. You know, it's nice to make something from nothing. It's pretty incredible, especially this particular book. So uh, this is the first of your books that I had the good fortune to read. It certainly won't be the last. But I just loved the family saga. I thought it was so character rich. And it made me think a lot about the sacrifices that we make for the people that we love, the ones that we know we make and that we make consciously and maybe some of the unconscious ones. So I really, really enjoyed it. But maybe you you can... They, well, you're welcome. Maybe you can start out by telling our listeners a little bit about what The Real Mrs. Tobias is about. The Real Mrs. Tobias is a, basically, it's a family saga. Those are my favorite kind of book. But what makes it different and possibly unique, I'm not going to say it's the only book of this sort, but I haven't run across another one like it, is that the family saga is told from the point of view of three women who've married into the family. So a, a matriarch, her name is Veronica. She's 74 years old. She's a psychotherapist and analyst. She lives in New York. She's a Holocaust survivor. She was a hidden child. She was not old enough you know, to be in the camps herself. Then there is her daughter-in-law. Her name is Melanie. She goes by Mel. She's a therapist who's got an MSW degree. She's married to the son of, of, of Veronica, Mel has a daughter-in-law herself. So Mel is both a mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. And as I am actually in real life. And her daughter-in-law is named Bertie. She's from Iowa. And she met Micah, who was the son of Mel. And they had a whirlwind romance and they got married and she moved to New York. And it all happened when she was very young. All three of these women got married very young. So we have three generations, 74 early 40s, and someone, they're about 20 years apart, each one, someone who's in her 20s. I loved that you focused on that mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship, because I don't think a lot of people focus on it. And it is really, 
really unique. This idea that you kind of marry into a family and you're supposed to love them and treat them as your family, but you know they're they're not the family you grew up with. What made you want to write about this particular relationship? Oh, well, that's an easy question for me to answer because I was completely inspired by my own life on this one because I have had a dynamic, formidable mother-in-law for a long time. She's my my own mother died quite a few years ago. And my mother-in-law is 98 and absolutely with it, you know, very informed on politics and other current events and just just leased a new car, which she drives very ably. And oh, my God, (laughs) it's an amazing bridge player and a very sharp woman that cares a lot about replenishing her wardrobe, to use her phrase. So and because a number of years ago. I have two sons. They both married, which made me a mother-in-law. It made me think about the role a little bit differently than I ever had and rather, you know, resent that it that there seems to be a predisposition to dislike your mother-in-law. Mm. And it made me think how important and interesting these relationships are and challenging. So um, because I like family sagas a great deal and, and every book I've written, except possibly the first, has been about bonds between people, I decided that I would explore this one. And that's why. That's so cool. Have your daughters-in-law and mother-in-law read this book? Yes, all three have read it. My mother-in-law said she cried when she read the author's note because that gave a little bit of the background that I told you and that she enjoyed the book and liked the book. And if she had more comments to it, she wasn't going to share them with me. And... um, (laughs) And one of my two daughters-in-law read and said she just loved it. And the other one I haven't heard from. But in all fairness, she's just made a huge move in her life from Santa Monica to Paris with my son, his two children. So she's been a little bit busy and we're still on speaking terms. I'm not. Phew. (laughs) (laughs) She's and no one in this book is a clone in any way, shape, or form of my own family, they except the fact that they're both daughter-in-laws and I have a mother-in-law. They're completely new fictionalized characters, obviously. But it it is I still, you know, um am very sensitive to their response. I think that's not I'm sure she liked it and she just hasn't had time to tell you. Um, <laughs> that's probably what it is. But um the other relationship actually I thought that you dove into a lot was the between kind of grandmothers and granddaughters and how the grandparent yeah. relationship is so different from the parental relationship, which is something I think about a lot watching my parents really? with my kids. I have yeah. 10-year-old twins, so they're now old enough that they really have a, you know, relationship with with my parents and mm-hmm. it's very different from my relationship with my parents and they treat them very differently and they're very different with them. Why did you, why, why do you think that is like, what's your hot take on being a grandmother since you are one? And, you know, why did you decide to also bring that out in this book? Well, first of all, my favorite character in the book, even though she's a minor character is the grandmother from Iowa, who's the kind of woman who keeps jumper cables. I love her. And, you know, and uh, when sews her own clothes and, you know, She's like so capable, normal. like a capable woman. Totally. I love that, that woman. It had a good sense of humor also. I grew up far away from grandparents. I was raised in Fargo, North Dakota. And my grandparents, my closest one, I had a grandmother in St. Paul, Minnesota, which was only 250 miles away, but I didn't really see her that much. It, it was a different time. And I had a grandfather in New York, my father's father. I'm not even sure if he would have known my name. You know, because there was no Zooming and, right. and was, you know, video conferencing. It was a, if you were far away, you were far away. I think I met him twice in my life. So when, when my oldest son announced, this was before he was married, that guess what? We have a baby on the way. I was just completely flummoxed because I had never seen myself as a grandmother. Right. I just had, I have a few friends who were really craving to have grandchildren, but I was just never in that category. I had a very fulfilling job and my life was full and I never really thought there was anything missing. I certainly didn't think that I didn't have too many friends who were grandmothers yet. I was completely gobsmacked by how interesting and wonderful it is to have a grandchild. 
you, you sort of step back and look at a child grow up in a way that's different than being a parent because you're not in it every single solitary second. And I, my oldest grandchild is 10 years old now, a really intellectually curious, funny, clever, creative boy. And um, I'm so close to him. And so I think that grand, and also my, my children really benefited from a wonderful relationship with uh, my father. Mm. My mother, unfortunately, became quite ill, but my, my dad and my husband's mother, who is also my mother-in-law, their grandmother, and they're still very close to her. And she's managed to maintain an important, interesting relationship with the whole slew of grandchildren and now some great grandchildren. So I felt it was a very important relationship to bring in. And then the character Mel in the book is very attached to her one granddaughter, Alice. Mm -hmm. And what happens in Alice's life has a major effect on Mel. I don't want to give away too much, but no spoilers, no spoilers. But they have a beautiful relationship. Yeah. Well, we don't know we don't know Alice's side of it because we never in Alice's head. But from Mel's point of view, it's a that's true. One one sided, yeah. one sided <laughs> in her life. Right. Um, so, like Birdie and Mel, you're a New York transplant, and New York features very prominently in the book. One of those characters fits right in; she becomes a New Yorker, and the other kind of seems destined not to. And I was wondering if one or both of those reflect your own experience and kind of moving to New York and becoming a New Yorker? Well, I, like I told you, I was raised in Fargo, which was a wonderful place to grow up, but I was really hell-bent on leaving because I wanted to, I wanted a job in the magazine industry. And I was offered the, an incredible job, the magazine called Mademoiselle, which doesn't exist anymore, but it, in its day, it was really terrific magazine for women in their 20s. And uh, so I moved to New York. And I was excited to be in New York. And, and even though I part of me stood back and, and analyzed New York and thought, I don't want to come, you know, 100 percent of New York. I mean, it was I was fascinated how about, for example, how New York makes you want things because there's so many consumer items all over you displayed so attractively. And it's, you don't find that in other cities when, you know, growing up, I wanted to dress like the girls from Seventeen magazine, but I could not find those clothes in the stores where I lived, so I, I couldn't. I couldn't do it. So part of me was always an outsider looking in, criticizing, I suppose, or at least analyzing. The other part of me was completely excited to be in New York, and I've never been bored here for a day in my life. And if you are, there's something wrong with you <laughs> because <laughs> New, York, New York offers so much. So I guess I was both. Yeah. Now, we were talking just before um, we started recording, but this is your seventh book, your sixth novel. Um, I read that you have been published in a dozen countries, probably more than that. So how does this time feel the same? How does it feel different? You know, what's interesting to me, Alicia, is, is how in every every time I've published a book, and there are a few years between each book. I'm not an, an author who turns out a book every year. I feel like I'm publishing into a different publishing landscape. Things change. When my first book came out, all I basically had to do after the the book was ready was like give a list of addresses to my the publicist at the publishing house. It was different. It was a major publishing house, but not the one publishing me publishing this book. Mm. And they threw me a beautiful party at this wonderful restaurant connected to the Museum of, of Modern Art. And I, you know, I had to be ready when the limo would pick me up for the the wonderful events. It's very different now. There's much more. There's much more on the author's back in terms of because of social media, in terms of publicizing the book. And what's different between this book and the last book, Another Side of Paradise, is that people seem to start publicizing their book a lot earlier. It just seems like people start a year in advance, and if you don't, you're really missing out, and you're you're expected to. Your publishing house really depends on you to do that. So I think that's you know, one of the, the biggest changes, but the, the thrill of publishing a book never gets old and it feels new all over again. You feel very, very excited. I feel just as excited as I did the first time. It's, it's, it's a wonderful feeling to make something from nothing. And basically what, that's what you're doing when you write a book. What would you tell yourself when you're the, you know, your former self? So you, when your first book came out, mm-hmm. what would you tell her now? knowing what you know and having done this so many times? I would say 
you might like this more than you think. Because I, I wrote a book kind of to fill my time when I was looking for a job. I had been um, an editor-in-chief of a major magazine and then another major magazine, but then a startup magazine. And the startup magazine crashed because Mm -hmm. most startup magazines do basically. And magazines had already started to fade away a little bit. I mean, you know, it was published by a major company and and also the Disney company. It was a a magazine that extended the brand of of Lifetime Television, which Mm -hmm. was, it's very popular now, but it was even more popular and unusual back then. And, uh, but unfortunately it didn't really take off as a magazine. So I wanted to get another job as an editor in chief of the magazine, but there aren't very many of them. It's right. um, there. You, you know, there's only one editor in chief at the top of each masthead. So I joined a writing workshop, which my friends thought was nuts because I'd been <laughs> writing my whole life as the editor of a magazine, but I had never written fiction, never. And the leader of the group, the writing workshop, encouraged me, and so did the other colleague writers in the group, and it just turned out to be something that I enjoyed and thought hmm, this may be this place to my strength more than being an editor of a magazine, even though it's very different. When you're the editor of a magazine, you have about, you know, 85 tasks to complete each day and you, and then you take a ton of work home at night. It's very lonely to be mm-hmm. an author. You, you know, I'm lucky enough to live in New York where I can meet other, other authors and, and you know, their friends for lunch or a glass of wine or something, but it's basically you sitting in front of your laptop. But I, I realized how much I liked it. And at that time, when looking for a job, the jobs were either in under places to me that felt undesirable, you know, making you, I didn't really want to commute to a job in Milwaukee, for example. Right. Not that it's an undesirable place, just that it's really far away from it's me. pretty far from New York. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I have, a, I have a husband and who I love and like to be with. But also, I didn't want to head up a celebrity magazine, and they were very much the thing about 15 years ago. And Mm -hmm. I just felt like I had worked too hard to do some fairly serious journalism to edit a magazine that was worshiping the Kardashians. Just wasn't me. So after the book came out and it sold in an auction right away, I started writing another one. And that book became a bestseller in Europe. So it was exciting. And after that, I just kind of stuck with it. And kind of by that time, it was very, the writing was on the wall that magazines were on their way out, which is sad. You made a good a good move. You made a good move. And what is your process like? So now that you have done this several times, you know, you must kind of have the same things that you do each time. What is your writing process like when you start on a new fiction project? Well, all my books are very character driven. So I always I always think of the characters first. And you know, the basic concept. I mean, one book was about four friends and one book was about a woman who was dead and she told the point it's called the late lamented Molly Marks and she tells it's a two double timeline it's part of it's when she's alive and part of it's when she's no longer alive and she has this way of looking back on her life from a place not having I call it the duration mm. so I start with an idea and characters and then part of me and I think this is the magazine editor in me uh-huh. I always <laughs> have a working title in mind that helps me focus and then the more I develop the characters and the more they start feeling like real people to me, the more I understand what they're going to do next. And so it's, I am not an author who outlines everything. I mm-hmm. admire people tremendously who can do that. I can't do that. My characters have to start telling me what's going to happen next. But I do help it along by throwing obstacles down in their way that they have to surmount and that creates tension in a plot. And somehow or other, it all works out. But that is my process is also inspired by being a magazine editor and that I'm quite disciplined. And I get up early in the morning and I sit down at the computer and I, you know, I put in a few hours and then take a break. And then usually once I've written something, I love to turn myself into an editor and go over it again and again. I don't want to tell you how many agains because I... I just don't stop reread. I usually reread what I've just written to start writing for the next day. So I bet your editors love you. They must get something very <laughs> polished by the time it comes to their desk. <laughs> oh, yeah, but it might have the word astonishing 25 times. You know, you get hung up on words. So, And I also keep trying to raise the bar in myself to try to improve the actual writing. And I've tried different 
slightly different kinds of books because one book was nonfiction and one book was a historical novel. Mm-hmm. So I keep trying to challenge myself, but there's a, basically what it comes down to is a lot of sitting in front of a laptop. Yep. I, I have found that as well, just in different places. I try to always change where I'm sitting so I don't get bored, but <laughs> <laughs> a lot, the I montage, the say- working montage would be just like a lot of typing in front of a screen. <laughs> Well, I have to say, I don't change the way place I'm sitting. And often when my husband comes home at the end of the day, he'll say, you're in the exact same place where you were when I left you at 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> okay, legitimate of, question. Do you like get up and get dressed to write or do you write in your pajamas? I personal personal it, question. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I've, I've been known to, you know, not change out of my nightgown until maybe, you know, 45 minutes after I've had my coffee and breakfast and I kind of eat my breakfast in front of my computer, but that's not all writing time. You know, I'll my email and do Wordle yeah. and, you know, <laughs> things one does to warm up. I got a text this morning from a friend who I was supposed to see for coffee and she said, I can't, I, she can't, she was canceling on me. She said, I'm really sorry if you got out of your pajamas just for me. And I was like, actually I did, <laughs> <laughs> but that's, but that's no, a hangover from lockdown. I think probably. <laughs> When getting out of my pajamas, I really don't upgrade that much because when I was a magazine editor, I really dressed up every day because people still did back then. I mean, I actually wore, you know, still, it was all about your like hair. high heels to work day. every day. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And now I can barely walk in them. And <laughs> um, so my d- idea of dressing up now is putting on a pair of jeans and, you know, a nice clean top. You know, we're not, we're not. And, and if I were working, it really would would be different, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be that big an upgrade because people don't dress up as much as they yeah, used to. Yeah, it's true. So, what is next for you? What's your next project, or what are you working on now, or what will you be working on soon? Well, I have, I have like many other authors, I have a book that I wrote during the pandemic. Okay, which I'm still kind of futzing with a little bit. I don't know what'll happen with that. Then I started something that I've read 75 pages into with a kind of a rough outline of the rest of it, which I've shown my agents. But then they they came back with a different approach for me. So I'm thinking, you know, I came up with a couple of ideas along their lines. So I'll be hopefully, hopefully I'll be writing another book. But Amazing. and then I I've been writing a lot of little essays lately, as one does when a book's coming out. And that's been fun. I, I like doing that also. So I might maybe, you know, try to do a bit of more of that until I really sink my teeth into a new book. So lots we'll of see. time still in front of your computer, but on various different books. Yes, products. yes, sadly, but <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it could be worse. So uh, my podcast that I do for Zippy's Network is called Quit Your Day Job. So I would like to know if you weren't writing, what else would you be doing with your life? Oh, well, travel especially now that my children, at least for one year, are in Europe. I think I mentioned that. Um, one's in Berlin and one is in Paris with their wives and with their kids. Travel, definitely. I wish I could travel more. But my husband's still working. You know, it's, it's we're, we're not going to be people who are going to be taken off for three months to backpack through the Alps or something. I think, the, you know, one, when I think of other things that I might have done if I'd taken another turn might have been to go into television Hmm. Or probably maybe be a, try to write scripts. I think that I, it never occurred to me to do that when I was when I was younger. I never thought of moving to California. But one of my sons is a producer and an agent, or rather a manager. And so I've you know got, I've learned more about the industry and and I really love writing dialogue and I love thinking of plot lines. So I think I might have wanted to explore that whole world. Maybe that can be your next challenge is going into a script, a whole new different style of writing. Who knows? Who knows? (laughs) Oh, Sally, it has been so wonderful to talk to you today. We always like to finish up here on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books with your advice to aspiring writers. What do you have to say to all of those people sitting in front of their computers too uh, who are looking up to your career and want to know what you think they could or should be doing? Well, I always tell people to try to find a writing workshop because I enjoyed being in one so much. And after I dropped out of it, I kind of formed my own. I, I approached a couple of people whose who's writing I enjoyed reading and who seemed to get what I was doing. And they weren't in conflict. Sometimes if you're in a writing workshop, people give you very conflicting 
suggestions and it mm. can make a mess of what you're doing. So I think it's very good to get some feedback. And if you can't find a writing workshop, at least have another a trusted friend read your work. The other, I think, would just be to read extensively to, and to try to slow down your reading so you're not reading exclusively for plot, mm-hmm. um, and to try to take note of how a book is constructed, and even to look more at the words. I keep a you know, running list of words that I like, and it's not cheating to do a find replace if you see that you you overuse a word and you want You've to use astonishing before. 26 times <laughs> yeah so dip into that your list and it can be it can be a way to jump start your creativity a little bit if you go over your and it can be or it could be a little scene and i also and this is something that i also think you should carry a notebook with you and write down little snippets of conversation that you hear or somebody expresses themselves in, in a way that you really admire write it down and I, as I mentioned to you, one of the books I wrote was about F. Scott Fitzgerald. I don't know if I mentioned it exactly, but one of the books was about F. Mm-hmm. F. Scott Fitzgerald and Sheila Graham, his girlfriend. I want to say mistress because she basically more supported him than he supported her mm. when it comes to finances. And he used to always carry a notebook and do that. So you'd be with the best of them, not me, Scott, if you, if you do that. So those are all things I that I love that idea. Well, it's What's important. That- New York is such a good city to eavesdrop on people. It's my favorite eavesdropping city. That's true because we're all crammed together like sardines. <laughs> oh, so Sally, your book is out now and your other books are available. And is there anywhere else listeners can find more information about you? Do you do you have any social? I know you've got a website because I've been on it. I do. Um, I have a website, which is sallycoslow.com. And co- it's Sally, S-A-L-L-Y-K-O-S-L-O-W. And I have an Instagram account and I'm, Pretty sure it's under SP Coslo. I don't think it's too hard to find it. And you can find me at Sally Coslo Author on Facebook. I'm not a big Twitter user, but once in a while I tweet something, and I think that's Sally Coslo also. So I'm there. You're I'm pretty everywhere. Visible. Pretty visible, yes. Awesome. Well, Sally, and, thanks and so I much. Actually, oh, sorry, okay. go ahead. No, no, go no, ahead. I'm just saying, and now because of video conferencing, it's easy to visit people's book clubs wherever they are. And I do think that The Real Mrs. Tobias is a terrific book for a book club because after you discuss what's going on with the characters in the book, you might want to segue into what's going on with your own mother-in-law or daughter-in-law. It could be interesting. I It'd totally agree. Along. I totally agree. I, as long as my mother-in-law is not in the book club with me, I definitely would like <laughs> to discuss this book with the book club. Yeah, Just kidding. I, I, lo- I love my mother-in-law. <laughs> Good. I love mine too. Did I not say that I adore her? You did. And I you called her formidable, her. which is which is a pretty awesome way to be described. I aspire to be described as formidable by my own daughter-in-law one day. So. Uh, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sally, thank you so much. And good luck with the rest of the book tour. It was so thank nice you, to meet you today. I loved it. Thank you very much. Be well. Take take care. You too. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music.